So I'm from California, and way back when I was on the college search, I realized that I'd likely go out to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. But my mum and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. But one of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there too, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people though that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and well worth the stop, so my mum and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old sort of rundown overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees, so my mum didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and so I did just that. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. Didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went onto the ledge and took some pics, sat and listened to the water for a while, then turned around to go back up. But when I turned, I got this really odd feeling as if someone was watching me or standing with me. I got really uncomfortable too and sort of started looking around. Nothing seemed to be wrong though, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mum the photos and realized that I didn't take a video. But my mum suggested I go back down to get the video. We've got time, she said, so again I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy, I suppose. I was down a slope, so my mum couldn't see me, and I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling just kept growing. I go to the edge, take the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of here, because there's an intense sense of urgency. I turn around to go back up, and some sort of force stops me dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An absolutely just overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Something that I'm yet to experience again, but I literally feel like I'm about to die. I still can't move and sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. And whatever it was, this thing felt huge and very much real, and yet I can't seem to get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck instantly stand up. It bends down, looms towards me, and right next to my ear says, Yoo-hoo. I kid you not that when I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and, like in a movie, went, drive, to my mum. My mum looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? And I just say, drive. She told me later that I was pale white and that the sense of urgency in my voice just told her that she had to get away from whatever it was that I was scared of. But what spooks me so much about this story is that I never actually turned around. It felt so real though that it could have been a person, but I was right against the overlook. I don't think it could have snuck up behind me like that. I've also gotten a similar sense of dread visiting other haunted places too, and I really felt like it was something paranormal. As for the Yuhu, it didn't sound male or female to be honest, but what it did sound was mean, as if... It was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I would love to hear your thoughts if you have some as to what it might have been, but as for me, I won't be going back there anytime soon. That's for sure. Do you guys know those silly school trips that last a few days? Well, well, I used to go on as many of those as I could because I loved them at the time. 
It was always so much fun to choose your roommates and decide who went on what bed and stuff like that. And I must have been maybe 12 or 13 at the time of this story. Everyone else involved being around the same age too. But this school trip was meant to be like any other as well. It was for my English class and it was about a certain author that we were studying at the time. The day started ordinarily too. Well, we got off of the couch and went up to our designated rooms. In the room was a shower and a toilet and four bunk beds. But one was closer to the door and the second was parallel to it on the opposite side of the room. I was on the bottom bunk and my friend Rosa was on the bunk on top of me. And my other friends, Eloise and Noel, they were on the other bunks. Eloise being on the bottom and Noel was on the top. Now, to get into our room, you had to go up two flights of stairs and sort of into a little foyer area. And from there, you had a door directly to the left of the foyer entrance door. You go through that door and there were two more doors, well, one to the left and one straight forward. But the one directly in front was our door. It's important to note too that some friends of ours were in the room to the left. We were also allowed to go out into small groups into the village or the town area as long as we told a teacher. I remember my room and the room next to us too went out to grab some snacks and food as we would not be having food until the next morning so we wanted something. As our room was bigger we all went in there to enjoy our masterful feast and it must have been around maybe 6pm I would guess but maybe a little later. Our school was very friendly, everyone knew pretty much everyone so we would have a set time that we would all go down and talk, socialize, play snooker, watch the Love Island, with subtitles of course, or just generally chill out. Our teachers would join in too, and it was a lot of fun. We would usually go up to our rooms around 10 or 11 p.m., and that night we went up at about 10. My roommates and I stayed up for a while, just sort of talking and sharing sweets around. The rooms next to ours didn't have a toilet, and they were worried about what they would do, so... We decided that instead of being smart and just giving them our room key and taking it back in the morning, that we would keep the door unlocked for them. And I'm pretty sure that I fell asleep at around midnight after everyone else had fallen asleep. At some point though, I woke up shortly after, completely naked mind you and half asleep as well, but I'm a light sleeper so when I heard the door click shut, I immediately woke up. At first, I sort of assumed that it was one of the girls next door coming in to use the toilet, but it wasn't. I heard a sort of low grunting or panting sound, which confused my little asleep brain to no end, but I concluded that it was one of the male teachers who just forgot to check up on everyone. It's not that uncommon, to be honest, but what I didn't expect was the dude to come over and sit down on the edge of my bed, as if... He was getting ready to get in. He sat on my foot and I guess that he felt it because he stood back up and put his hands on the end bars of the ladders on both of the bunks. I assume trying to stay standing up. For some reason I still thought that it was a teacher but I was starting to wake up a little bit at this point. Starting to take in the situation. I heard him say, this isn't my room. It's a room with girls in it. And I just replied, uh, yeah, it is. But it was weird, because it wasn't a question, and he didn't sound confused or embarrassed. He stated that he was in a room full of young girls, and he knew that he was there. I'm pretty sure that he purposely looked for a girl's room too, but he also didn't speak like a normal human being. Looking back, why on earth I wasn't freaked out by this point, I have no idea. Know too that this is only the first night and a lot of crazy things happened on that trip, some of which are going to haunt me forever. And always lock your doors no matter what. Be smart and be safe and remember, if something happens to you, especially if someone does something to you, it's never your fault and you're not alone. But anyway, I heard slight shuffling and the door click shut again. And that's when it clicked for me that there was an unknown man in our room. And I had just talked to him. Well, I bolted up into a sitting position and quietly slipped out of bed, grabbing our room key off the coat hook that we put it on. And then I saw legs. I would have screamed if I wasn't so stunned, scared and tired, but I scrambled back into my bed. That's when Rosa woke up. She was incredibly tired and I was on the verge of panic attack. 
She was incredibly tired, but I was on the verge of a panic attack. I got up off of my bed so she could see and just pointed at the legs when she saw them, and she went wide-eyed and looked like she was about to join me in my panic attack. We started whispering, trying to figure out what to do next, but then Noelle woke up, asking us to be quiet as she was trying to sleep, so Rosa broke the news that we probably wouldn't be sleeping properly at all that night. Noelle didn't believe us at first, so I tiptoed over to her and showed her the legs, and then it hit both of us that he was completely naked. There was a naked, unconscious for all we knew, man in our room, just in front of our door, blocking our only escape route from this room. And so far, it wasn't looking too great. I went over to Eloise and shook her awake. She scared us half to death with how loud she sounded, but we were terrified that this man had come into our room with bad intentions and was either pretending to be unconscious so that we would go near him, or that he somehow managed to knock himself out, but if we went near him, that he might awake him. I got Eloise to calm down, and Rosa once again explained as I started to break down. The other girls were close behind me, and both in distress. It was at this point that we got our phones, and we started calling every friend and contact that was on the trip with us, desperately hoping that they were awake so that they would come and save us. But sometimes, you just have to be your own hero. We were trying to stay calm and figure out a plan when Noelle was able to reach her dad on the phone. He gave us some advice about how to handle the situation, but ultimately told us to get out and find someone to help us now. Remember though that this man was in the entryway and blocking the door with his head, and it honestly felt like we were trapped, but in the end, we decided that we just had to do it. If it went wrong, then we would just hit him on the head with the door, and it was that simple. Noel went first, followed by Eloise, then me and then Rosa. The door was only open a crack, so we had to move quickly and quietly, trying to fit through the crack as best as we could, otherwise we ran the risk of hitting him and waking him up. I'm fairly certain too that Rosa actually hit this guy in the head, just to spite him, and I wish that I had the confidence to do that, but I didn't. We went through both of the doors and out into the open space of the foyer area, at the left end of the area was one of the male teacher's rooms. I remember frantically knocking on that door, still being careful not to wake the man or anyone else up, but no teacher ever answered. So we kind of just stood there in the middle of the open area, freaking out, crying ourselves a river. Looking back, I kind of feel stupid, but we can't change the past, right? But then, all of the teachers on the trip came out of a corridor talking quietly. Obviously seeing us sobbing, seeing me and Noelle collapsed on the floor in a breakdown, was not what they had expected to see that night. And apparently the man had been walking around most of the rooms, trying the door handles, knocking on the doors, just trying to get in. My male teachers had caught him and taken him downstairs, and at that point he had a bedrobe on apparently, but the teachers had gone to one of their rooms to figure out what they should do next. Since we were underage and part of a school, they had to call the police. We had to stay up and wait for the police to arrive, and we had to go to a separate area where the female teacher's room was and calm down over there. But can I say, too, that the lady who told us to be quiet because she and her husband wanted to spend some quality time together, and we were just disturbing their peace? Screw you. We were traumatized 12-year-olds. I mean, come on. When the police did eventually arrive, though, they took the man downstairs and we were asked some questions and we asked questions in return. And the police told us that apparently the man wasn't drunk, he wasn't on drugs either, and he honestly had no reason to be there. They had no idea what his intentions were or what he was doing that night, but he was kicked out of the hotel and was apparently never allowed back there. But I guess that... That's the creepiest part because we assumed for so long that he was either drunk or on drugs or something, but no, apparently he wasn't. So what was he doing just laying there in that hallway, making it almost impossible for us to escape like that? To this day, I still don't know what that guy was up to, but I have a feeling that it was no good.
I lived in a pretty average sized town my whole life. It was overrun with drugs and one of the worst homelessness problems per capita in the country. Living there, I knew not to trust anyone, but I had enough friends there that I mostly felt safe. But eventually I transferred colleges to one of the biggest, richest cities in the country, and when this happened, I'd been living there for about a year. I felt safe, even alone. At my school and home were outside of the regular touristy places, and my neighborhood was mostly retired rich couples or students like myself. I felt safe walking to and from school by myself, so I really wasn't expecting this to happen. So, I normally don't give any strangers the time of day, mostly because I just didn't want to interact with people. But this day, I guess, I was just feeling talkative. I was in my neighborhood, walking back from school, but still had a few streets away from my house when I heard a voice above my music. I pulled out a headphone and stopped, and I heard a, a man calling out for me. I placed it behind me, but didn't see anything, and figured it must be coming from the car behind me. I don't know what was going through my head this day and why I didn't just keep heading home, but I walked towards the car and it was a tan SUV, not screaming danger, but I took a mental note of the first three of his license plate and when I got to the passenger side window, it was already rolled down and there was a man sitting in the driver's seat. He was in my general age range, had on nice clothes, a button-up tie and he was immediately attractive. Not out of place and not immediately untrustworthy either, but in the end I just thought that he needed directions. He asked if I went to my college and I said yes. He told me that he sees me by the science building every day and thought that I was pretty. This is where my alarm bell started to ring a bit because my major was nowhere close to science and I was only ever on campus twice a week, if that. He asked my name and I gave him a fake one but told him that he must have mistaken me for somebody else because I was never by science. He got extremely nervous and I started to pull away. The alarms in my head were screaming at this point. He told me to wait though and asked if I could take him out for a drink right now even though it was like barely noon. I turned him down citing the fact that I had a boyfriend. He said, what you can't have friends? in a sort of condescending but forced casual way. Scared now too, I apologized and said that my boyfriend was waiting for me. It was a lie, but I felt like he needed to know that someone was going to miss me. Now, I've never had such a strong fight or flight instinct hit me before, and I pulled away, walked away as fast as I could. I guess in the heat of the moment, I failed to check if he was following me. But the next time I head to class, I was walking up my street and stopped dead when... I recognized the same car again. I feigned realizing that I forgot something and I walked back into my house, frantically texting my boyfriend. And after that, I just stopped walking to class for a month. A few days after this, I was getting ready to leave for work and I was working the open shift so I was leaving my house at like 4am. And even before this, I was very careful about being aware of my surroundings, especially before and after getting into my car. But as I was pulling out, I noticed his car two houses down from mine, closer than last time. I texted my boyfriend and let him know, and we agreed that I wasn't going to be leaving the house alone until we figured out what was going on. I work in an industry that casually attracts cops, and the morning shift especially invited at least five of them at any time to be hanging out in our lobby. So, I had cultivated a fairly strong and friendly relationship with a few of them. The morning that I left and noticed him, I sat down with the cops that had gathered for the morning and explained my situation. And they said that while something definitely wasn't right, they couldn't really do anything for me because, well, no threat was made. Not long after my conversation with my cop friends, one of them was responding to a call about a suspicious vehicle, completely by accident, recognized the car as my description of his car, and remembered my story. He told me that he walked up to his car and asked what he was doing, just sitting in his car like that, citing the call that they received and noticed obvious evidence of surveillance. A camera, a few notebooks, food wrappers, water bottles. They ran his info and it actually turned out that he had a warrant for assault with a deadly weapon and harassment. I was called in shortly after to identify him and also to make a statement. 
after he was arrested, I was told that it was obvious that he'd been stalking me for weeks. He'd even documented when my boyfriend came and left and admitted to wanting to kidnap me at some point, having all the equipment to do so in his car, saying that he was just waiting for the right moment, but my boyfriend was just always in the way. I thank those cops every day for saving me from what definitely could have been the worst experience of my life, and my observant neighbors for calling his car. I guess the moral of the story is trust your gut and always be aware of your surroundings. So I went hiking with one of my old friends. He used to be homeless and in a really bad situation with his parents, so I let him stay with me until he got on his feet. Now one evening, before he actually started staying, he went to get his stuff from the woods that he was posted up that night. It's probably like 11pm or midnight when we met up. I had work and I got off late. But we go to the woods to pick up his stuff and we kind of got lost in the dark. It was abnormally dark that night, considering the full moon was fixing to come around for its phase. Neither of us had flashlights and my phone had died so I couldn't use that. It was bad planning, I'll admit. But we stumbled across a bunch of decently large mounds of dirt in this offshoot of the woods. Each mound had a small tree growing from the middle and a crude blank sign at the tops. At this point, it was eerily quiet considering that on our way over, the woods were insanely loud with cicadas and whatnot. When we hear a branch snap nearby while trying to look at these mounds, and decide to get back to finding his stuff. We eventually found his campsite and we hurried out. Outside the woods now, we're walking down a one-way street leading to the main road. A large moving truck comes our way and slowly passes us by. We pay it no mind and just nod and keep going. The truck turns around and pulls around into a sort of little offshoot on our right, stopping parallel to us with the engine. The driver gets out and just kind of watches us. We weren't being conspicuous or anything by looking back, just glances over the shoulder here and there. Nothing that you could make out in the darkness from the distance that he was anyhow. We're almost at the top of the street and to my car when... He goes to the back of his truck and I guess opens the back door. And the next thing that we hear is at least three dogs barking their heads off and a flashlight pointed our way. We started running and we had to do some evading through nearby neighborhood streets before we could get back to my car. Eventually we did though and we just sped the hell out of it. But nothing ever really came of that afterwards too. No cops, no local town chatter, nothing. Well, more did, but that's a different story altogether. And at this point, I'm done with this. So, even though I consider myself a very rational, sort of sciencey person who doesn't believe in the paranormal, that some experiences with my daughter have led me to at least be more open about this. And also, it's still something that I'm super fascinated with, even if I struggle to believe it. I also never really talked about the experiences that I'm about to tell you about, since I'm surrounded by people just like me who just kind of brush this stuff off. Anyway, it all started in my last apartment when my daughter was like four. I'm a single mum and it's just been the two of us after I separated from her father for some time. So the first thing happened when we were both playing in her room and she seemed very focused on our Playmobil game when this conversation happened. She says to me, mum, he wants to say hi. And I'm like, what, who, the Playmobil figurine? And she says, no, mum, the monster. He's sitting right next to you, can't you see it? I, obviously slightly uncomfortable, say, no baby, I, I can't see him. Are you sure that he's there? Yeah, you really can't see him? He's waving at you. And then she started waving at something invisible next to me. I just kind of brushed it off as some sort of a, a fantasy and changed the topic back to our play. Another time, we were also playing with her Playmobil stuff, which was between me and her, and she was sitting across with her face showing towards me. While we were playing, 
But she annoyingly turned around and looked back and made the go away movement with her hands and said stop. And a few seconds later she turned around again, did the same movement and said stop it. I asked her what was wrong and then she came to me and sat on my lap and did the same gesture again and said go away. I asked her again what was wrong since I was really confused and she was like the monster keeps touching me and I don't like it. Honestly, this is where I started being creeped out as well. So I said leave her alone monster and proceeded to play with her and distract her but this is where I started to feel really uncomfortable in my apartment. The worst one though was definitely at night when we decided to sleep in the same bed in my room since it was the weekend. I remember I woke up at probably around 3 in the morning I think, just after it I'd guess, and saw her sitting on the bed just staring at the wall. I asked her why she wasn't sleeping and she said, I, I can't sleep when the man is standing next to our bed. Now, as I said, I'm a pretty rational person who for the most part attributes these things to kids blooming fantasies but in that moment it took both my non-existing balls to tell her that it's okay and I cuddled up with her until she fell asleep instead of freaking the hell out and leaving the apartment in the middle of the night. I still kept telling myself that it's just a fantasy and that all kids have this sort of stuff but what was stranger to me though was that all these things stopped happening when we moved. She never talked about a monster or weird man again, never told me that she saw something that I couldn't see. But the really weird coincidence about all of this though is that in that apartment is where I had my first and only ever sleep paralysis experience. I was sleeping on my stomach as usual and I woke up and couldn't move or speak. And suddenly I noticed something stroking my hand and whispering my name into my ear. It was super terrifying in that moment but... I know what sleep paralysis is and why it happens and that it can cause all kinds of hallucinations so for me it was 100% this. It never happened again thankfully too but I'm also glad that I'm out of that apartment since all the weird stuff happened there own. This happened a couple of years ago while I was still in high school and live feed cameras those ring door cameras were first becoming a thing. It must have been about 2014 or 2015 or somewhere around there anyway. So I used to go running in the woods right by my house in upstate Washington. The trail began very steep, almost like a hike, and then became more flat and steady. And that was where I would always begin my runs. I would run every day, roughly around the same time in the morning, around dawn, and also afternoon before and after school. Now, I was running before school one morning, and a tall man with a beard and a plain tan hat was sitting on the bench at the beginning of the trail. I hated dealing with people because I was an awkward teenager, so I began to look at the ground and just walk by him. As I got closer, I could tell though that he was staring at me. I walked past him and I was going to go up the trail, I slightly turned around and saw that he had stood up and was walking the trail behind me. Keep in mind the sun is barely coming up so it's mostly still dark. And then I ran. This was not my normal job too because I was sprinting at this stage. Nobody was ever on this trail in the morning and I had never seen him before and for some reason it just creeped me out. I knew that I could go through the forest basically to my backyard so I wasn't that worried but I was afraid that he was going to attack me or something. As I got further down the trail I must have lost him so I slowed down because frankly I was out of breath. But then I heard a man's voice say loudly as if he was screaming well aren't you going to introduce yourself? And that was when I lost it. I called my mum and told her that I thought someone was following me on the trail. I told her a brief version of what had happened and she told me that she could meet me with her car at the head of the trail. And just in case the man was following me, she didn't want him to know where we lived. I went down a trail that shortcuts to the head of the trail and was looking out for the man the whole time. I got to my mum's car and started sobbing and crying. I don't really remember why I started sobbing. I just remember being so scared that I was going to be kidnapped. The rest of the day went normally too and 
I went to school and went to all my classes and for the most part just forgot about what had happened. The rest of the week too was pretty normal. Until Friday night on my way home from school I stopped at the grocery store and on the way out I swore that I saw the same man. I thought that I was imagining it to be honest so I just kind of walked to my car and we drove home. I didn't want to do much on the weekends and so I just stayed home and chilled with my family, smoked with friends and that was about it. I was up late with my friend Josh just watching bad movie after bad movie and then we started to hear a knocking on the window at around 3 in the morning. At the time I had some annoying middle school kids in the neighborhood who were always pulling pranks so although it was creepy being the macho kids that we were we just ignored it and were trying to play it off like we were ignoring the annoying middle schoolers. The knocking then transferred from the back room where we were onto the windows by the front door though. In the morning I told my parents and my dad checked the ring camera and as you can probably guess by now it was the same man. There were a multitude of clips of him, first a couple of him walking past the camera as if he was walking back and forth in front of the house to see if he could see inside, then a couple of clips of him kind of stepping back and looking up as if he was trying to look into the upstairs windows from afar. These clips ended around 1.45 in the morning I think, then at around 3 or 3.05 he showed up again and was tapping the windows and we could see him clear as day in the camera. At one point, he stood back and realized the camera was there and just stared into it. He did this a few times and then got really close to the camera and whispered what sounded like, how was your run? He smiled and then he just walked away. My dad called the police and had them come out to the house. We showed them the camera footage, but since we did not have cameras in our house or in the back, we couldn't prove that he was actually trespassing and there's nothing illegal about talking to somebody's doorbell. I never did see him again after that and when the police checked back the following month they said that they thought that once he saw the camera he must have got freaked out and decided that he was caught and decided to drop whatever he was planning to do. It was a, a really terrifying situation. I mean I was literally being stalked. Also, uh, I'm a guy, so something like this has never really happened to me and hasn't since then too, so it was just really weird and really freaky. Safe to say though that I got a gym membership after all of that and I haven't gone running down that track since. So this happened in 2011. But for some reason too, I, I can't get a direct link to the story because the local news website isn't working or at least the article about it isn't working or maybe it's broken or deleted or something. There is some mention of it online and you can find people talking about it on forums and linking to the article which appears to be broken or deleted too. So before people start calling me out for not providing a source, just google body found at James A. Reed and you'll find what I'm talking about. So I live really close to James A. Reed. It's a little memorial wildlife area of a little over 3,000 acres. It's a popular location for fishing because it has something like 12 small lakes. I consider them large ponds really, but semantics. It has hiking as there are numerous hiking trails that traverse the entire area, all of which are pretty much light hiking or sort of nature walking sort of trails. It's a popular spot for photographers for shooting portraits, and during hunting season it's popular for bow hunting too. I personally am an amateur photographer I guess, but I do portraits for a sort of side gig. I like to fish too, and I also like to go hiking. And so it's basically one of my favorite places, and I go there really often. I got into portrait photography by shooting school photos and couples and such at this location too, it has fields with tall grass, great colors in the fall, docks, and easily accessible changes in scenery. It's basically a photography gold mine. I still do photography, but I'm quite a bit better known at this point, and obviously significantly better than I was then. But I still use James A. Reed as my go-to location for almost everything. Boy Scout troops also go hiking through the area on nature walks and such. It's a very popular area, in fact. 
In the summer of 2011, though, the body of a 19-year-old guy was found at the wildlife park. They call it a wildlife park, but, I mean, the wildlife amounts to deer, fish, lots of snakes, squirrels, and cranes. I've never really seen anything else there, and I've been there more times than I could ever really count, I think. Anyway, the story of this kid's body was a minor new story, but since I was so familiar with this area, it was of interest to me. But the news report was immediately confusing. You see, according to the report, the kid had been partying with some friends and he'd OD'd at the party, and the story breaks apart here because... His friends say that he wandered off and they didn't know where he went. His mother thinks, for no clear reason, and this is the operating story that the news went with, that he OD'd at this party and his friends dumped his body in the wildlife area in the middle of the night. But both of these things are pretty much impossible and I'll explain exactly why. So the article mentioned which lake this body was found near. It was Bodark Lake, which is pretty much the farthest lake from the entrance to the park that you can get to. And getting to this particular lake requires driving down about a mile and a half long paved road that hasn't had any service in like at least two decades. This thing is riddled with potholes that are car killers in fact. If you don't know where they are too, you have to take the road slow. Because hitting one of these things in anything short of a full size pickup will likely destroy your tire and wheel. I've driven it so many times that I have the potholes memorized now and can drive it pretty normally, weaving in and out of them when they come up. But in the dark of night, this would be really tricky, especially for some drunk and high teenagers. But that in and of itself isn't impossible to do, I suppose. But there are three gates between the entrance and where this body was allegedly found. One right at the driveway leading into the park, which is one of the large swinging steel gates. The next gate is just after that one, and in order to get to Bodark, you need to make an immediate right-hand turn after the visitor center, and that is where you run into the 10-foot tall chain-link fence that's meant to keep the deer in the wildlife area. This fence runs the entire perimeter of the reserve as it's right off of a highway, and they want to make sure the deer stay there for hunting season. You need to get through a second chain-link fence gate that's chained shut every night too, the park opens at sunrise and closes at sunset, and after you go through that gate, you get on the previously mentioned paved road for about three minutes and come to what they constitute as the ranger station, but it's really just a, a big parking lot, pretty much. From there, there's another giant fence gate that is chained shut at night. After you're through that gate, you're in the clear to get to Bodark Lake. Now, the trail near Bodark Lake is particularly scenic, and I've used it countless times for photo shoots. It's also a good walk through nature, so the next day my girlfriend and I decided that we should go and check it out, see if we could find where they found the body. I know, it's a bit disrespectful, but we really were going to go there anyway, so why not, right? Well, we did find where they found the body. We know this because the police tape was still there, but... Man, it was one heck of a chore. In order to get where the body was found, you had to start on the trail near Bodark, but about five minutes into the walk, go completely off the path and go through the trees and brush, down an extremely steep slope that goes downward about 20 feet, and cross the stream at the bottom. The stream was about three to four feet deep, as it was running high, though the water doesn't move very fast. The only reason that we knew where we were going was because the original trail was high enough up that, through the trees, we caught the glint of the yellow caution tape way in the distance. When hiking, we both wore a pair of Vibram hiking shoes that didn't have trouble with water. Yes, the ones with the weird toes. But the water was still deep and we didn't particularly want to go swimming. So we walked upstream for quite a while until we found a section that was thin enough to jump across. Mind you... We walked upstream about 10 minutes before we found this, and then walked back down the stream to where we had been to continue in the direction of the caution tape, which we could no longer see now that we were on level with it. After a few more minutes of sort of trudging through particularly thick brush and forestry, we finally arrived at the second stream, on the other side of which was the roped off area of police tape. The actual taped off area was pretty small, so we were able to tell pretty much exactly where the body was found. 
It was on a pile of rocks right on the other side of the stream. We didn't cross this stream because, well, we found it and I guess that was good enough. I mean, there was really nothing else to see. And we'd gone from a class 0 nature walk to a class 2 and at times class 3 hike to even get here. And that really got me thinking too because there was just absolutely zero possibility of any drunken teenagers carrying a human body this far into the wilderness in the middle of the night. And this is after they bypassed the three gates, which were never reported to have been broken into at all. This kid was way off the beaten path and was very literally in the middle of the wilderness. It was so remote, in fact, that his body was there for at least a couple of days before anyone found it. Now, I've done a lot of hiking and even completely sober in the middle of the day. This was a real challenge to get to. It's equally impossible that he just wandered away from some party in the middle of the night and just found himself here. I mean, there are houses along the highway across from James A. Reed, most of which are farms, and if you go a couple of miles down the highway, you do find a residential area. But the notion that he got messed up, wandered miles down the road, hopped two 10-foot fences, walked a mile down a barely paved road, went into the forest, crossed two deep streams, sat down on a pile of rocks, and decided to OD in the middle of the forest, is equally, if not more unlikely. So I guess the question is, what happened to him? I don't know, but... I think it's a lot more likely that they went into the forest during operating hours and all started doing something in the middle of the forest and they left him where he died. But still, this is a massive stretch and I cannot stress to you the difficulty of getting to this location. Anyway, why am I telling this story? I mean, it just sounds like some really shoddy police work, right? I'm getting there though. Hang with me. So, we started our retreat back to the actual trail, climbing through the trees and the brush, which was now significantly more difficult because we were going uphill, back to the first stream, and after that it was a steep incline, which was definitely going to require grabbing trees and getting firm footholds, and a bit of teamwork too. But before we got that far, we had to track back upstream to get to the point where we could jump across it. And right here is where it got really weird. So... As we're following the stream up, we stopped dead in our tracks because a middle-aged man in a full business suit was just walking in the stream. He was a tall guy. The water came up right around his chest. He was in a white dress shirt, a black blazer, black tie, and he had a briefcase in his hand that he was kind of letting float behind him. He was walking downstream, so coming directly towards us, but paid us no mind. We both just sort of stopped and stared at this guy, and then at each other as if to silently say, what the heck? And both of us backed up as he got closer to us. He passed us by without saying anything or even looking in our direction. He was bald, white, probably around 45 years old I'd say, and fairly broad. He had a completely blank expression on his face, and he honestly looked like he hadn't slept in days. What I mean is that he had massive bags under his eyes, which were just completely dead, for a lack of a better term. His expression was just dead. Like, slightly slack-jawed and eyes glossed over. It's worth noting, too, that he was dry from the chest up, like he had just entered the water and started walking downstream. He was just walking straight down the stream, too, very slowly. And we just sort of stood there, completely silent staring at this guy until he passed us by and we were now looking at the back of his head as he marched forward. Mind you, he definitely could have easily exited the water at any point here. The embankment wasn't difficult, but he just sort of soldiered on down the stream. We now moved away faster than we safely should have, I admit, running up the stream to jump across and get back on the trail and to our car, where but we drove off and both immediately started asking each other what the heck that was. We tried to tell our friends about this experience, but it was beyond even really conveying how weird this was. It's even hard telling it here like this. It was just dead silent in the forest too, or at least it seemed that way. 
All we heard was him sloshing through the water as he slowly made his way downstream to wherever he was going. To be honest too, I sort of expected to read about another body being found. Like, this guy was off to hang himself in the forest or something, but no such news articles ever appeared. But the vibe that he gave off, like, man, I really can't explain the feeling that seeing this guy gave us. It was like overwhelming dread, confusion, and I'm sure some terror too. I really don't know how to explain the emotions that we were feeling, and we both agreed that we didn't even have words for it, but... It was totally a foreign feeling. Anyway, I'm asking all of you guys out of curiosity, what do you guys think we came across out there? I know I probably didn't need all the backstory, but it's a weird case that locals generally feel was not sufficiently answered, because anyone familiar with the area and location will tell you exactly what I just did, that both accounts of how he got there are just basically impossible. So, were uh, the body and the businessman in the river related? Or did he just stumble upon something else while out looking for the location? Who or possibly even what do you think this dude was? I want to tell you that it was just a guy randomly walking down a stream of disgusting murky water in a business suit. Because, let's be honest, weirder things have happened. But I just can't shake the feeling that this guy gave off. I don't know. What do you guys think? I lived in a pretty average sized town my whole life. It was overrun with drugs and one of the worst homelessness problems per capita in the country. Living there, I knew not to trust anyone, but I had enough friends there that I mostly felt safe. But eventually I transferred colleges to one of the biggest, richest cities in the country, and when this happened, I'd been living there for about a year. I felt safe, even alone. At my school and home were outside of the regular touristy places, and my neighborhood was mostly retired rich couples or students like myself. I felt safe walking to and from school by myself, so I really wasn't expecting this to happen. So, I normally don't give any strangers the time of day, mostly because I just didn't want to interact with people. But this day, I guess, I was just feeling talkative. I was in my neighborhood, walking back from school, but still had a few streets away from my house when I heard a voice above my music. I pulled out a headphone and stopped, and I heard a, a man calling out for me. I placed it behind me, but didn't see anything, and figured it must be coming from the car behind me. I don't know what was going through my head this day and why I didn't just keep heading home, but I walked towards the car and it was a tan SUV, not screaming danger, but I took a mental note of the first three of his license plate and when I got to the passenger side window, it was already rolled down and there was a man sitting in the driver's seat. He was in my general age range, had on nice clothes, a button-up tie and he was immediately attractive. I'm not out of place and not immediately untrustworthy either, but in the end I just thought that he needed directions. He asked if I went to my college and I said yes. He told me that he sees me by the science building every day and thought that I was pretty. This is where my alarm bell started to ring a bit, because my major was nowhere close to science and I was only ever on campus twice a week, if that. He asked my name and I gave him a fake one but told him that he must have mistaken me for somebody else because I was never by science. He got extremely nervous and I started to pull away. The alarms in my head were screaming at this point. He told me to wait though and asked if I could take him out for a drink right now even though it was like barely noon. I turned him down citing the fact that I had a boyfriend. He said, what you can't have friends? in a sort of condescending but forced casual way. Scared now too, I apologized and said that my boyfriend was waiting for me. It was a lie, but I felt like he needed to know that someone was going to miss me. Now, I've never had such a strong fight or flight instinct hit me before, and I pulled away, walked away as fast as I could. I guess in the heat of the moment, I failed to check if he was following me. But the next time I head to class, I was walking up my street and stopped dead when... I recognized the same car again. 
I feigned realizing that I forgot something and I walked back into my house, frantically texting my boyfriend. And after that, I just stopped walking to class for a month. A few days after this, I was getting ready to leave for work and I was working the open shift so I was leaving my house at like 4am and even before this I was very careful about being aware of my surroundings, especially before and after getting into my car. And as I was pulling out, I noticed his car two houses down from mine, closer than last time. I texted my boyfriend and let him know and we agreed that I wasn't going to be leaving the house alone until we figured out what was going on. I work in an industry that casually attracts cops and the morning shift especially invited at least five of them at any time to be hanging out in our lobby. So I had cultivated a fairly strong and friendly relationship with a few of them. The morning that I had left and noticed him, I sat down with the cops that had gathered for the morning and explained my situation. And they said that while something definitely wasn't right, they couldn't really do anything for me because, well, no threat was made. Not long after my conversation with my cop friends, one of them was responding to a call about a suspicious vehicle, completely by accident, recognized the car as my description of his car, and remembered my story. He told me that he walked up to his car and asked what he was doing, just sitting in his car like that, citing the call that they received, and noticed obvious evidence of surveillance. A camera, a few notebooks, food wrappers, water bottles... They ran his info and it actually turned out that he had a warrant for assault with a deadly weapon and harassment. I was called in shortly after to identify him and also to make a statement. After he was arrested, I was told that it was obvious that he'd been stalking me for weeks. He'd even documented when my boyfriend came and left and admitted to wanting to kidnap me at some point, having all the equipment to do so in his car saying that he was just waiting for the right moment, but my boyfriend was just always in the way. I thank those cops every day for saving me from what definitely could have been the worst experience of my life, and my observant neighbors for calling his car. I guess the moral of the story is trust your gut and always be aware of your surroundings. So I went hiking with one of my old friends. He used to be homeless and in a really bad situation with his parents, so I let him stay with me until he got on his feet. Then one evening, before he actually started staying, he went to get his stuff from the woods that he was posted up that night. It's probably like 11pm or midnight when we met up. I had work and I got off late. But we go to the woods to pick up his stuff and we kind of got lost in the dark. It was abnormally dark that night, considering the full moon was fixing to come around for its phase. Neither of us had flashlights and my phone had died so I couldn't use that. It was bad planning, I'll admit. But we stumbled across a bunch of decently large mounds of dirt in this offshoot of the woods. Each mound had a small tree growing from the middle and a crude blank sign at the tops. At this point, it was really quiet considering that on our way over, the woods were insanely loud with cicadas and whatnot. When we hear a branch snap nearby while trying to look at these mounds, and decide to get back to finding his stuff. We eventually found his campsite and we hurried out. Outside the woods now, we're walking down a one-way street leading to the main road. A large moving truck comes our way and slowly passes us by. We pay it no mind and just nod and keep going. The truck turns around and pulls around into a sort of little offshoot on our right, stopping parallel to us with the engine. The driver gets out and just kind of watches us. We weren't being conspicuous or anything by looking back, just glances over the shoulder here and there. Nothing that you could make out in the darkness from the distance that he was anyhow. We're almost at the top of the street and to my car when... He goes to the back of his truck and I guess opens the back door. And the next thing that we hear is at least three dogs barking their heads off and a flashlight pointed our way. We started running and we had to do some evading through nearby neighborhood streets before we could get back to my car. Eventually we did though and we just sped the hell out of there. Nothing ever really came of that afterwards too. No cops, no local town chatter, nothing. Well, more did, but 
that's a different story altogether. And at this point, I'm done with this. So, even though I consider myself a very rational, sort of sciencey person who doesn't believe in the paranormal, that some experiences with my daughter have led me to at least be more open about this. And also, it's still something that I'm super fascinated with, even if I struggle to believe it. I also never really talked about the experiences that I'm about to tell you about, since I'm surrounded by people just like me who just kind of brush this stuff off. Anyway, it all started in my last apartment when my daughter was like four. I'm a single mum and it's just been the two of us after I separated from her father for some time. So the first thing happened when we were both playing in a room and she seemed very focused on our Playmobil game when this conversation happened. She says to me, mum, he wants to say hi. And I'm like, what? Who? The Playmobil figurine? And she says, no, mum, the monster. He's sitting right next to you. Can't you see it? I, obviously slightly uncomfortable, say, no baby, I, I can't see him. Are you sure that he's there? Yeah, you really can't see him? He's waving at you. And then she started waving at something invisible next to me. I just kind of brushed it off as some sort of a, a fantasy and changed the topic back to our play. Another time, we were also playing with her Playmobil stuff, which was between me and her, and she was sitting across with her face showing towards me. While we were playing, she annoyingly turned around and looked back and made the go away movement with her hands and said stop. And a few seconds later, she turned around again, did the same movement and said stop it. I asked her what was wrong and then she came to me and sat on my lap and did the same gesture again and said go away. I asked her again what was wrong since I was really confused and she was like the monster keeps touching me and I don't like it. Honestly this is where I started being creeped out as well. So I said leave her alone monster and proceeded to play with her and distract her but this is where I started to feel really uncomfortable in my apartment. The worst one though was definitely at night when we decided to sleep in the same bed in my room since it was the weekend. I remember I woke up at probably around 3 in the morning, I think, just after it, I'd guess, and saw her sitting on the bed just staring at the wall. I asked her why she wasn't sleeping, and she said, I, I can't sleep when the man is standing next to our bed. Now, as I said, I'm a pretty rational person who, for the most part, attributes these things to kids' blooming fantasies, but in that moment, it took both my non-existing balls to tell her that it's okay and... I cuddled up with her until she fell asleep, instead of freaking the hell out and leaving the apartment in the middle of the night. I still kept telling myself that it's just a fantasy and that all kids have this sort of stuff, but what was stranger to me though was that all these things stopped happening when we moved. She never talked about a monster or weird man again, never told me that she saw something that I couldn't see. But the really weird coincidence about all of this, though, is that in that apartment is where I had my first and only ever sleep paralysis experience. I was sleeping on my stomach as usual, and I woke up and couldn't move or speak. And suddenly, I noticed something stroking my hand and whispering my name into my ear. It was super terrifying in that moment, but I know what sleep paralysis is and why it happens, and that it can cause all kinds of hallucinations, so... For me, it was 100% this. It never happened again, thankfully, too, but I'm also glad that I'm out of that apartment since all the weird stuff happened there own. This happened a couple of years ago while I was still in high school, and live feed cameras, those ring door cameras, were first becoming a thing. It must have been about 2014 or 2015 or somewhere around there anyway. So I used to go running in the woods right by my house in upstate Washington. The trail began very steep, almost like a hike, and then became more flat and steady. And that was where I would always begin my runs. I would run every day, roughly around the same time in the morning, around dawn, and also afternoon, before and after school. 
Now, I was running before school one morning, and a tall man with a beard and a plain tan hat was sitting on the bench at the beginning of the trail. I hated dealing with people because I was an awkward teenager, so I began to look at the ground and just walk by him. As I got closer, I could tell though that he was staring at me. I walked past him and I was going to go up the trail. I slightly turned around and saw that he had stood up and was walking the trail behind me. Keep in mind the sun is barely coming up so it's mostly still dark. And then I ran. This was not my normal jog too because I was sprinting at this stage. Nobody was ever on this trail in the morning and I'd never seen him before and for some reason it just creeped me out. I knew that I could go through the forest basically to my backyard so I wasn't that worried but I was afraid that he was going to attack me or something. As I got further down the trail I must have lost him so I slowed down because frankly I was out of breath. Then I heard a man's voice say loudly as if he was screaming, well, aren't you going to introduce yourself? And that was when I lost it. I called my mum and told her that I thought someone was following me on the trail. I told her a brief version of what had happened and she told me that she could meet me with her car at the head of the trail. Just in case the man was following me, she didn't want him to know where we lived. I went down a trail that shortcuts to the head of the trail and was looking out for the man the whole time. I got to my mum's car and started sobbing and crying. I don't really remember why I started sobbing. I just remember being so scared that I was going to be kidnapped. But the rest of the day went normally too and I went to school and went to all my classes and for the most part just forgot about what had happened. The rest of the week too was pretty normal. Until Friday night on my way home from school I... Stopped at the grocery store and on the way out, I swore that I saw the same man. I thought that I was imagining it, to be honest, so I just kind of walked to my car and we drove home. I didn't want to do much on the weekends and so I just stayed home and chilled with my family, smoked with friends and that was about it. I was up late with my friend Josh just watching bad movie after bad movie and then we started to hear a knocking on the window at around 3 in the morning. At the time, I had some annoying middle school kids in the neighborhood who were always pulling pranks, so although it was creepy, being the macho kids that we were, we just ignored it and were trying to play it off like we were ignoring the annoying middle schoolers. The knocking then transferred from the back room where we were onto the windows by the front door, though. In the morning, I told my parents and my dad checked the ring camera, and as you can probably guess by now, it was the same man. There were a multitude of clips of him, first a couple of him walking past the camera as if he was walking back and forth in front of the house to see if he could see inside, then a couple of clips of him kind of stepping back and looking up as if he was trying to look into the upstairs windows from afar. These clips ended around 1.45 in the morning I think, then at around 3 or 3.05 he showed up again and was tapping the windows and we could see him clear as day in the camera. At one point, he stood back and realized the camera was there and just stared into it. He did this a few times and then got really close to the camera and whispered what sounded like, how was your run? He smiled and then he just walked away. My dad called the police and had them come out to the house. We showed them the camera footage, but since we did not have cameras in the house or in the back, we... Couldn't prove that he was actually trespassing and there's nothing illegal about talking to somebody's doorbell. I never did see him again after that and when the police checked back the following month they said that they thought that once he saw the camera he must have got freaked out and decided that he was caught and decided to drop whatever he was planning to do. It was a, a really terrifying situation. I mean I was literally being stalked. Also, uh, I'm a guy, so something like this has never really happened to me and hasn't since then too, so it was just really weird and really freaky. Safe to say though that I got a gym membership after all of that and I haven't gone running down that track since. So I'm not entirely sure where to post this, but... This is about an experience that my husband and I had while exploring the Great Smoky Mountains, more so Blue Ridge Parkway, 
on the NC side. We're both super into Missing 411 and creep each other out with stories of skinwalkers and watch a lot of Mr. Barlin on YouTube. If you haven't seen his videos and you like this sort of stuff, then you should check him out. He goes over a lot of different Missing 411 stories. Anyway, we were driving along Blue Ridge Parkway, stopping at the many different overlooks and overall it was really gorgeous. We went just a little while ago, early November, and the weather was perfect. We had seen a few side roads, some named and some unnamed, and I'm not 100% sure what possessed us to go off road on an unnamed road, but we did. The road was gravelly, there was a bridge or a tunnel that we had to go through. It was covered in graffiti, so we thought, oh, okay, people must have come through here, there's graffiti, so clearly we're not the only ones who have been down here before, and we continue on. We came across these three open gates to three different roads, one to our left, one in front, and one to our right. The one to the left had the gate swing outward, as if it was exit, the other two swung inward like an entrance. So we chose the middle road and again continued on. We started on down this road and suddenly the gravel turned to dirt, and the road went from a decent size to a very slim one lane road. If you've been in the mountains, then you know that the roads can be pretty nerve-wracking, really sharp curves, one side of the car facing the mountain too, and the other side clearly showing you a massive drop off the side of a mountain. So just imagine all of that on this tiny road. If someone was coming up the road, I would definitely have to back up. There was also nowhere to turn around for a really long time too. Nevertheless, we went down this mountain for a good 20 minutes before we saw anything other than trees and rocks. I should also note too that there was no sound other than the tires on this dirt road. No bug sounds, no birds, like it was completely dead silent. There also was a small turn off and I decided to go down it thinking the road connected and took us back up. It probably did but there was a stream going right over the part where the road was supposed to connect. And when we got there, there was a red truck on the other side of this stream with two guys watching us. They crossed over the stream and went past us, looking at us and nodding. I got a glimpse of one of the guys and something about him just felt really off. I can't explain it, but I got a really nervous feeling deep in the pit of my stomach. Now, I don't have an off-road car, I have a mini SUV. I don't even have a four-wheel drive. So, none of this was a smart idea, I know. But I decided that we shouldn't go over the stream in case my tires got stuck. We didn't have my cell phone service, so we wouldn't even be able to call for help if the car did get stuck. So, we decided that we should turn around. I am a bit of a master of three-point turns. This day, however, my husband had a feeling that he should get out and help me turn around. I kept having this nervous feeling and didn't want to get out of the car, but he insisted, so he did. He helped me turn around easily enough, and we got back in the car and we went back up the little side road, deciding whether to go up the mountain to where we came in or to just keep going. And it was then that he told me that he saw something in that little stream road as we drove down it, and that's why he wanted to get out, to see what it was. And apparently it was a piece of metal, like sheet metal, like part of a broken guardrail, and it was sticking out of the ground like it was intentionally put there. Now, there were no guardrails anywhere near us. There was no reason for it to be there, just a chunk of metal stuck in the ground like that. We were surrounded by trees and nature, and not a single metal structure anywhere near us that would explain why this was there. He said after that too that he got a really uneasy feeling upon seeing it. He didn't tell me any of this until we were back in our cabin, safe and sound mind you, but for some dumb reason, we continued to keep going down this stupid mountain. We continued down the road for a little bit longer, thinking that we were going to reach a bottom point and go back up the mountain and come out through the other gate. But no, instead, we reached a house, a single white house, not abandoned, just sitting there hidden behind a bunch of trees at the near base of this mountain. I sort of looked at my husband, who looked at me, who looked back at this house, and I just said, Nope. We looked back at the road ahead of us, and it continued to go down. But like, 
how much further can you go down from the base of this mountain? I have no idea because when I saw that steep decline where the road continued to go further and further down, I just noped out at that, turned the car around and we started driving back up this mountain. I want to mention too though that the further that we drove down this road, the quieter and darker it kept getting. It was like 3pm on a super sunny day and the forest that we were surrounded by on this mountainside was not dense at all. In fact, I could look up and see blue sky clearly, but around us was a feeling, eerie and just dark. It wasn't a good feeling, that's for sure. Even as we turned around and made our way back up the mountain again, my husband was worried about other cars coming down, but I looked at the road and noticed our tire tracks were the only ones on this road. Upon seeing that too, I just got this immense feeling of being watched. Kept looking in my rear view thinking that I was going to see someone or something. Maybe even that red truck from earlier coming up at us, but there was nothing and I just couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us and wasn't happy when we turned around. It wasn't until we were back at the top of the mountain where the road had begun when we heard birds again, heard the chirp of insects and everything lightened back up. The air also felt less thick, which was really strange. But our anxiety though, that stayed heavy for a couple of days even after this. But after this happened, we went to our cabin and started looking up David Pollardi's map. And where we were that day was an area on the map that was apparently marked as clusters. And tons of people had apparently gone missing in that area and we just felt so stupid for being so careless like that. Thankfully, we are safe, but just thinking about it sends shivers down my spine because, well, what if? What if we kept going? What if I ran over that metal thing and busted my tires? What if the red truck came chasing after us? I don't know, but for anyone interested or can find more information on what we experienced... We were in between Jenkins Ridge Overlook and Big Witch Gap on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So, if you know anything about this place, then please do let me know in the comments below. So, I'm right now sitting on my front porch, smoking a cigarette. I, I just can't bring myself to go back inside my house, because... Well, there's someone in there. You see, just over two months ago, I moved into a new house after losing nearly everything to COVID. I won't go into details or draw this out, but you need to know that. Just typing this out makes my eyes well up and every hair on my body stands straight up. But I, I saw a human-shaped shadow in my walk-in closet. Am I going crazy? Maybe. I don't know that I'm not at the same time. Okay, uh, this is what happened. So, I'm lying in bed just browsing Reddit, and from the corner of my eye, I catch movement coming from my closet. But within literal milliseconds, I turn, and I swear to you that I, I see someone standing inside of it looking right at me. I flipped out, sprung up, ran out of my room, slammed the door, and grabbed a kitchen knife. I yelled and screamed about calling the police and that I had a knife and basically acted like a scared monkey, but there was no response. After about a good minute of yelling and realizing that I'd actually left my phone in my bedroom to call 911, I slowly peeked in. When I did, there was simply nothing there. Nothing. No one could have gone anywhere though. But, man, am I terrified about this. I mean, I saw this person. I saw their shape, their movement, their arms. There was a humanoid figure in my closet, and that's all I know. I don't know what to do from here, but I guess I just needed to share this to get it off my chest. I've never really told this story, at least not completely, but it's something that I still think about from time to time. It kind of haunts me. So, I used to work as a manager of a fast food place in a rather seedy part of a medium-sized city. 
I'd worked at the nicer location until they decided to transfer me, and there were rumours that the location I ended up getting sent to was going to be shut down anyway, which did end up happening a few years after I finally left. But anyway, the point is, is that the place wasn't being well taken care of. The dining room was dated and old, the owners were certainly not updating or maintaining the place well. They were just barely maintaining the very basic safety requirements and sometimes weren't even doing that. For example, I often worked the closing shift, which for this location at the time was 4pm to midnight. Between 7pm and 11pm, it was me running the drive through and front counter by myself and one employee running the kitchen. At 11pm, that other employee would go home and I was left by myself to tidy up and do the deposit between 11pm and 12pm. This isn't really safe, and I'm not sure it was even entirely legal at the time. But this was over a decade ago, though, so who knows. Now, just to provide a little bit of context and background here. I'm a girl, but I'm not what you would consider small. I'm six foot, and during this time, I think people would probably say I came across as more than a little stern. I was younger, but I already spent years working in fast food, getting treated terribly by customers, and having drinks and food thrown at me. The location that I worked at was a swarm with junkies and drug dealers and just general scary behavior, and all this is to say that I didn't get ruffled that easily, and I took a lot of things in my stride. However, on this night, I was working the night shift with a new guy. The new guy had probably been working there for no more than a few weeks. I'd worked with him a few times before, but never the closing shift. And from the first time that I'd met him, I'd always gotten a, a strange vibe from him. And again, I'm not someone who, at the time, got ruffled easily. Prior to this, I'd worked with a night janitor at the other location, who'd had an Adderall addiction and rather unpredictable and scary rage problems and some creepy incel kid who barely spoke more than two words at the time, and when he did it was always something about how much he disliked women, and me in particular. Not an exaggeration either, that's actually what it was like. But this guy, this new dude, he was a whole different level of weird. He had a kid and professed to be a single father. He would brought the kid around during the day, and the kid in his clothing were always really dirty, like, really dirty, and not only that, but the kid also occasionally had bruises on his head and arms as well. The kid was a toddler, and I know that toddlers can get into things, but one look at that kid, and I knew that those bruises were not from just a little kid messing around. I never saw the new guy behave aggressively towards his kid at all, but I don't know, it was just a bit of a feeling. And that feeling translated into other things. I don't know, he was just creepy, maybe that's the best way to say it. It wasn't one thing in particular, it was just a, a feeling I got when I was around him. He was a medium height, stocky young guy, he was totally average in every way, but he just had a vibe about him. He was always friendly and never rude or aggressive, but his eyes were just lifeless, for a lack of a better description. Anyhow... On this night, I think he might have been called to cover a shift for somebody else or something. I was in charge of making the schedules most of the time, and I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have scheduled him to work a closing with me since I found him so off-putting. But the first part of the night was actually fairly normal. I ran the drive through and the front counter, and he ran the kitchen between 8 and 11, and... He was talking to me, on and off between orders, telling me about his ex and how he'd come to be a single father. Apparently the mother of his child had a drug problem. In hindsight, I think a lot of what he said was meant to inspire sympathy. He really laid the troubled tale of him and his son on thick, but at the time I just felt a little bad for both of them really. Especially his kid, who I suspected was being abused as well. And despite being as stern as I was, I was definitely still young and naive when it came to manipulative people. He told me that he'd moved to the city and immediately had trouble finding work prior to getting the job at the place that we worked at. He said that he'd been running out of money and was behind on rent, bills, and didn't have any formula for his son. At the time, I think I just empathized with him and said that that really sucked. We were both working in fast food and 
I thought it was obvious that neither of us had any money. The place was bare bones minimum wage anyway, and I was barely getting by with three roommates and only pretty much eating the free meal I was given from restaurants every day. But anyway, he laid it on thick all night, but I don't know that I was really paying all that much attention to it. People tended to ramble when working the late shift, and I'd gotten used to listening to people spontaneously talk about their personal problems. In fact, I had a bit of a habit of listening and not really reciprocating the sharing, and I guess this didn't really go over very well with this new guy. Because at some point, the new guy said something to the effect of, You don't talk much, do you? I'm telling you my whole life story here, and you've got nothing to say? I don't know if it was just that I was coming across as unsympathetic, or more likely, that he was frustrated that I wasn't successfully manipulated into giving up personal details about myself. As far as I was concerned, he was just someone that I was working with, and I didn't know him. In fact, I didn't really want him to know me, and certainly I wasn't about to start telling him anything that wasn't surface level chit chat. But the guy was really intimidating. Something about his tone was off, and it definitely wasn't a jokey accusation or off the cuff comment. I can't remember exactly what I said, too, but I remember that I just tried to play it off somehow. He didn't say anything more about it, but after that, the silence between us seemed a a little tense. At 11pm, it was time for him to go home. The normal procedure was that kitchen closer would tie to the area and an actual kitchen cleaner would come in a few hours later to deep clean things. In our case, it was a husband and wife team who did several locations, but they didn't usually come in until a few hours after I left. So, this guy was only tasked with a basic tidy and then I would let him out, after which I would stay behind to prepare the deposits. But instead of this happening smoothly, this guy goes off into the staff bathroom and stays there for a long while, like almost 20 minutes or something. I didn't know what was going on, nor did I know exactly how to handle the situation. It had honestly never happened before. People usually could not get out of there fast enough at the end of the night, so it was weird. Was he sick? Did he fall asleep or something? I didn't know, but... Honestly, I just wanted to get my work done and go home. He finally emerged and quickly walked to the door and left. I was relieved and it was weird, but I just kind of shrugged it off and hurried back to the office to get done what I needed to do. And not even 10 minutes later, I start to hear a banging at the back door of the restaurant. Loud, repeated banging. But normally I would ignore this. The back door faced an alley and was right next to a street full of bars and pubs. People leaving the bars and the pubs often got the idea for some reason that banging on the door would get them after hours food service because, well, they were drunk. So this wasn't necessarily uncommon. So I just ignored it and kept hurrying to get things done. But the banging did not stop. It somehow just seemed to get louder and louder and more urgent too. So I finally got up and I went to look at the people to see who was there. At this point I was definitely on edge and this edginess swelled into full out anxiety attack when I see that it's the new guy standing at the back door. Now my first thought was not to open the door. I really didn't want to open the door in fact. But I knew that he knew that I was in there. What if he forgot something inside? What if it was his house keys or car keys or something? I was going to have to leave the building by that same door at some point as well, so there really seemed to be no escaping. So, reluctantly and very stupidly, yes, trust me, I know, I opened the door. What I opened the door to was, quite frankly, terrifying to me. He said that he left his jacket, or keys maybe, I can't remember, inside, and I told him to tell me where and I'd go and get them. I didn't want him to come inside. If this had been any other person I worked with regularly, this would have been no big deal. I'd let them back in, let them get whatever they left behind, and they'd take off. But I instinctively knew that I didn't want this dude back inside, in the dark empty restaurant, with me. But the new dude was not having it. He just pushed past me and said that he'd get it himself. Then he proceeded to shut himself in the bathroom again. And at this point, I just panicked. 
Instead of just staying there by the door, which in hindsight I should have, I rushed back into the office. Stupid girl, that's me, had left some of the cash that I was counting for the deposit out. A question for you as well is, what dummy would answer the back door at night at all, and especially with a till out? Well, this girl I guess. Anyway, I managed to stuff the cash into the safe and lock it before he came to find me. The office was dark. It was summer and the air conditioning was on full blast, but this dude was sweating like a lot. I was taller than him and I'm not a small girl like I said, but somehow I just knew that this guy was about to hurt me. He was keyed up. As I watched his eyes dart around the office, I grabbed my jacket hanging on the hook next to me. I hadn't finished my deposit, but I was getting out of there. I didn't care how much trouble I got into in the morning for my work not being done. I smiled and told him that I was just leaving and that he could walk me out. I was really trying to not show my panic. But whatever he had planned, I wanted to give him an out for him to rethink it. So I smiled, grabbed my purse and started to move towards the door. The new guy who was standing in the doorway didn't budge though. He started talking, though, about his son, about the money trouble that he'd been having, and capped the whole story off with a request for a loan. From the tone of his voice, it was clear that this was not a loan. He was demanding money from me, and he said that he would pay me back as soon as he got paid, and that I'd really be helping him out. I didn't know what to do, to be honest. I mean, he had me trapped, and I wasn't leaving the office or the building unless he allowed it. Or at this point at least, I wasn't leaving without a fight. Something told me too that despite my height difference, I wasn't about to win. So, in the end, I just gave him some money from my wallet. For $50, I think. When I gave it to him, he said, Thanks, you're really helping me and my son out. I won't forget it. When he said it, he just had no expression. No smile, no speech, nothing at all. He didn't seem grateful or even relieved, just dead eyes, arms limp at his sides and it was terrifying. To this day, I really don't remember how I got him to the door. All I remember was shutting the door behind him, making sure the door was securely locked and rushing into the office to burst into tears. I didn't finish my work, but I stayed in there until I could force myself to leave out of the same door. I was sure that he was going to jump me when I left. The thought never occurred to me for some reason to just call the cops. I don't know why. I guess I just felt like nothing serious had happened yet. I mean, he'd asked me for money and I'd willingly given it to him, despite the fact that I felt I had no choice and had been scared half to death. But I only saw him one time after that, and neither of us never mentioned that night or the money. I don't know why I didn't ask for it back. I think I was embarrassed or scared or perhaps both. I don't know. I don't think I've ever told anyone in my life this story, or at least if I have, I definitely left out the part where I gave him money and never got it back. And pretty quickly after that, he stopped showing up to his shifts and I never saw him again. Now, I don't believe in throwing words like psychopath around. I think people overuse the psychology terms like that way too much, making them just synonyms with anyone who is just horribly behaved. And there are a lot of varying degrees of terribly behaved people in this world, unfortunately. But after taking a lot of abnormal psych classes, I can say that there was definitely something about this guy's effect that was just wrong, for my lack of a better term. I'd smile and he'd smile. I'd frown and he'd frown. It was almost like talking to someone pantomiming emotions. Maybe I'm just remembering it that way because it was such a terrifying experience for me, but the truth is is that I've never been comfortable talking about this event. And to this day, when I think about it, I feel just as uncomfortable as I did the day that it happened, more than a decade ago now. In the end though, the head manager at my restaurant did make an anonymous call to child services about the guy's kids, unrelated to my incident obviously. I don't know what, if anything at all, came out of that. But boy, is that one night that I'll never forget. So starting from the beginning, way back when, when I was about six, 18 now, I'd just gone through six losses when I was five. 
or the people that I had lost were very close to me. One of them being my grandmother, maternal. I had to move in with my mother's family. I was always close with my mum, so I was kind of excited to move in. But after I moved in, we all started having these weird experiences. I'm only really able to speak on mine, but here's what happened. I'd be talking to my sister at night and sit up to find out that she was never really there to begin with. Or losing something only to find it in a totally separate part of the house. Everything was small at first. But when we moved into our own place, it stopped for a while in fact, but when we started visiting the house every weekend, it was like all of the small things just followed us to that apartment. My parents went to rehab to get clean, so we wound up moving into the house again. My Aunt Ruth was in charge. Her and her boyfriend were addicted to Oxy. She was awful as well. She would ground us for 30 days plus at a time and only let us go outside if we did the tasks that she was supposed to be doing to live there rent-free in the first place. She gave a nine-year-old a chainsaw and it was like get to work, unsupervised as well on the back porch. But anyway... Weird little things started happening as soon as we moved in. We would hear things like footsteps in the attic when nobody else was home. The windows don't open, they're little metal openings in the wall, nothing can hit through the slots or anything. Or there was banging in the garage when everybody was in bed. But things got worse after Chris died. I didn't really ever dislike him, but there's nothing anybody could have done. It was about a month or two after my parents moved into the family home. It's downstairs and next to the dining room. You could see into the middle garage, which was a little room in between the garage and the house. And they always said that they saw a man with long white hair pacing back and forth, talking to himself, but it was always nonsense. And no words with actual meaning, that is. Now, Chris had picked up this habit of laying in bed and talking to who everybody, including me, thought was himself. But one day I was sleeping, it was about 7pm, and it was like I'd just woken up and was moving around, but I never actually woke up. And I saw this woman was walking around. She was really beautiful. She wore a black dress that went to her ankles and black high heels, a pearl necklace and big neat curls, and she was sitting on the bed. And I knew she wanted me to talk to her. We got up and we walked until we got to my aunt's bed where Chris was laying talking gibberish to himself again and she stood over it and put a hand on my shoulder and then she said he's going to come with us soon and then I woke up to Ruth arguing with Chris about voices that he'd apparently been hearing and of course she assumed that it was the drugs who wouldn't right he was found hanging in the woods behind the family dry cleaners the next day by his dad and then his dad hung himself in the back patch of the same woods that week. After all that happened, things mostly calmed down. I went to middle school, started 8th grade, and I was struggling with mental health myself and had attempted to take my own life multiple times as well. I was in and out of hospitals and eventually went to a group home where I was transferred to a long-term hospital that sent me home. But when I moved back in, everything was just different. Usually weird things would happen to us in our house, but I would go to my friend's house and for days after I left, things that usually happened at my house were happening there now, while my house would be fine. But the energy here was always heavy as well, and nobody can relax, and my friends refuse to come over because things happen to them and their houses when they leave. The biggest and most terrifying things happened this year, though. The first one was actually a phone call. My stepdad was sitting on the chair in his bedroom. We were smoking and he got a call and he put it on speaker so that we could still smoke. But nobody spoke. It was just a, a keyboard smashing. Then a woman repeatedly saying her fingerprints were cold and she couldn't feel her fingers. Also, every single male in my house has been sexually harassed by something. Lately, I feel like I've been targeted... And what made me share this was an experience from last night. So I was in my room in the nude because I just showered. I was doing my hair on my computer chair with a towel down to keep the chair dry. And first I 
could have sworn that somebody was behind me. I felt like someone was watching me. Like they were staring directly at me, if that makes sense. So I stood up to light an incense and I started to pray. And I swear to you that that towel was yanked right from under me. After I got into bed and I shut the lights off, it was about 3.30 in the morning. I was just about to fall asleep when I felt something that was almost like a hand, but was way too big for one and long. And it wrapped around my knees and pushed me. I started praying while having a mini panic attack and eventually I just ran downstairs, grabbed a Bible, prayed for like 20 minutes and then I just slept on the couch. Well, I've been sharing this with you guys as well. Three doors downstairs open and slammed. I'm home alone with my stepdad and he's in his bedroom. I couldn't include every experience that me and my family have had, obviously, in this house because that would mean talking for basically forever. But if anybody wants to hear more or can even give me some tips, I'd be happy to share and I'm all ears. To give the context of where this story is based, I live in a smallish college town near a small to medium sized city. The town itself doesn't have a, a lot of people and is mostly here to cater to the demand that comes from the college. Because of this, the stores around the colleges are mostly open 24 7 so that the college kids will be able to impulse buy whatever they like. The other big seller around here though is Gats. Of course, gas can be bought in the city, but being a town that is often gone through in order to get to the city, a lot of places will try to keep the price of gas slightly lower than many of the stations in the city. My story begins when I was working overnight in a gas station, a liquor store, when I was doing part-time classes in college, but mostly doing classes online, so they wouldn't ruin my availability for a full-time job. The store that I had worked at only had one person working on overnights for a long time. Even though a lot of people, especially girls, would complain of the lack of cameras and the fact that you don't always get the best people going into the liquor store and the gas station in the middle of the night, they basically did nothing about it. The owner's hand was forced though on one night before I started working there that a woman came in to buy some milk, went outside to her car, only for a man to come up behind her and shove a gun to her back, demanding her money. She complied with him, and luckily he let her go. She ran into the store, sobbing hysterically, and though the police arrived shortly after, he was never found. I personally preferred having two people on, even if there wasn't a safety issue. The night seemed to go by just so much quicker when there was somebody else there, and, and it was really nice that the person that I normally closed with and I got along really well. Overall, there were four overnight shift workers, Josh, Nick, Dixie and myself. Dixie had another job and she really was only working there as a favour to one of the managers, so she only worked two nights a week with either Josh or I. Josh and I worked together three nights a week and Nick worked with Josh or I two nights a week. Dixie was actually really nice and fun to be around but she didn't particularly like the job and want to be there. But Josh would get annoyed with her a lot for just standing behind the register while he did all the work. But it was only one night a week, so he didn't complain too much. Nick, on the other hand, was a, a bit different. He worked there five days a week, just like Josh and I, but they never seemed to put him with one person more than one day a week. Nobody really seemed to like him or like working with him. But Nick was a, a little off from the start. He was one of those people who told you his entire life story as soon as he met you, giving a bunch of really personal details that nobody was really comfortable hearing. But one thing that he always seemed to talk about as well was the strain on his marriage. Apparently he had a really bad drinking and drug problem for a very long time or something, and the drug part got better when he could switch over to weed, but he couldn't seem to get his drinking under control. He was hard to be around, I'll admit, but you kind of get used to some people on that kind of job being sketchy. I was there for almost three months when Nick's story seemed to sort of escalate just out of nowhere. He began telling people that when he was younger, he was diagnosed as a psychopath and he had to take a bunch of pills for it every day so that he wouldn't become violent. 
Not exactly what you want to hear from someone you're alone with in the middle of the night, right? But, okay, I guess. We all have our problems, and some people get dealt a bad hand when it comes to mental illness. I myself have always struggled to get my anxiety and depression under control, and without medicine, I wouldn't be killing people by any means, but I'd probably be hospitalized in danger to self categories. So, as creepy as that was, I assured him that a lot of people need to take medicine for some kind of illness, and as long as you stick to it and are honest with the medical professionals, there's no reason you can't still do anything anyone else can do. He seemed pleased with this answer, and soon after, the subject was turned to other things. He was also especially cheery and nice to me after that for the next week or so, letting me know daily that he was taking his medicine and felt like things were going well with it. I always answered enthusiastically, but I'm pretty sure everyone else, especially Josh, was aware of how much I wished that he would stop talking to me about it and would just leave me alone. Josh had a wife and a daughter who was two at the time, so he couldn't help but see us younger girls through the eyes of what his daughter might potentially have to deal with when she was our age, and seemed to go out of his way to end my conversations with Nick rather quickly, which I'll admit I was grateful for, and he didn't really try to pretend that he liked Nick, like, ever. But it wasn't long before Nick started conversations with me going into details about why he was diagnosed instead of just how his medicine was working, which I won't go into here because a lot of it was very violent, sort of sexual. I told him repeatedly that I didn't want to know about that, to which he would act like he understood and then change the subject, only for him to circle back to it about an hour later. When I confided to Dixie about it, she told me that she would take care of it and told her friend, which was the manager, who asked her to come to work there, the manager couldn't really seem to do much though since I was really the only one that he would talk to about these things and told me to come to her again if he ever made me feel uncomfortable again. It was starting to get increasingly tense for everyone working with him, especially after he was talked to by the manager. And soon enough, two other women who worked with him on the night shift report comments that he made to them to the manager as well. I was questioned, in which I agreed to all of the statements made by the women were similar to things that had been said to me, and Nick was given a final warning and also a write-up. The next couple of times I saw him, though, he would go on rants about how people were only reporting him because they didn't like him. I assumed that he didn't know that I had been questioned, and neither Josh or I had any intention to tell him. He got so angry at one point that he practically was in tears, saying how lucky these people were that he was on his meds and what he would do to them if he wasn't. But luckily, it was about that point that the shift ended, and pretty much as soon as he clocked out, Josh told him that we had a lot of work to get done that night, so we didn't really have time to chat with him. And then he nodded and walked out the door without another word. Josh wasn't lying either. The truck had come extremely late that day, so there were still quite a bit of things that still needed to be put out on the shelf. But one thing that the earlier shifts never seemed to do as well, unless they absolutely had to, was stocking the drink coolers. It was true, I suppose, that it was a lot easier to do at night when there were a lot less customers. So, it was annoying since we couldn't chat, but we just went with it. I can't remember the time that Josh went into the drink cooler, but... It must have been pretty late since we'd been there for a while at that point. I was still focused on stocking the shelves and making sure everything looked full that we didn't have when the bell chimed signaling someone had come in. I threw out a good evening and I'd be right there since anyone that came in that late usually only wanted a pack of cigarettes or to pay for the gas and cash. I put down my box and went to the registers, slowing dramatically when... I saw who it was, and you guessed it, there was Nick, looking at me, but leaning next to my register. Now, I'd be lying if I said that I had a reason to be afraid. It did turn out that he was drunk, but I couldn't detect it right away from the smell of booze that always seemed to linger in the air around there, and Josh was right on the other side of the wall as well. Even so, though, I considered for about 30 seconds if I should actually go or 
if I should run into the cooler and get Josh. Nick wasn't a young fit guy or anything. Years of drugs and drinking had aged him prematurely and ruined his body. He was still intimidating to a 20 year old girl, let me tell you. Unfortunately, Nick made the decision for me when probably tired of waiting, turned toward me and that's when I noticed immediately that there was just something off about it. My voice was nothing more than a pathetic whisper when I asked him what he wanted and he just stared at me, nothing on his face to tell me what he was thinking. I was about to speak again when he spoke barely intelligible because of his slurring, and he said, you leave here alone? It took me a second to shake my head and tell him in a hopefully steadfast voice that Josh was in the cooler and asked if he wanted me to come and get him. Again though, he just stared at me in silence. I didn't really care what he said anymore, I just wanted him to say something. The silent staring was really creeping me out. I asked with more force in my voice, what do you want, Nick? As soon as I stopped speaking, he grinned at me, and in a disgusting, almost singing voice, he said, You're lying. You're alone. He laughed and took a step toward me, but stumbled, allowing me to take several steps back. At this point, I definitely should have run to Josh. I should have called for him, anything, but I couldn't believe that I was reading the situation right. Nick was really weird, but... I never felt an actual danger around him before. He had never come off as just more than a little unstable. He continued to come forward in this slow stumbling step motion though, telling me to come here. I just want to talk. I kept out of his reach, telling him to back off and that I would hurt him if I had to. He thought that that was particularly amusing and laughed loudly enough that Josh told me later that was what caused him to look through the spaces of the racks and see what was going on. Josh was out of the door in a second and seemed to come out of nowhere, shoving himself in between Nick and I. They didn't even say anything, just sort of stared each other down before Josh said in a stern tone, I think you should leave now, man. Nick stared blankly for a moment and scoffed, telling us that we couldn't take a joke. I was trying not to cry at this point. The only thing more terrifying about the situation was knowing that if Josh hadn't have been there and he had somehow caught me, I would have stood no chance against him. Josh left me standing with my back against the wall, corralling Nick to the door. Completely unexpected on both of our parts, Nick turned and took a swing at Josh. Luckily, either because he was drunk or just really under-coordinated, he missed Josh's face completely and Josh grabbed the back of his coat and brought him down as he smashed his knees into Nick's stomach or chest area, I'm not sure which, and used the opportunity of his sputtering to drag him to the door and throw him out, locking it. Josh had just turned and told me to call the cops as we heard this sickening crack behind him. We both jumped and looked at the door to find this big circle of glass. It's hard to explain, but if you've ever seen a movie of one or an actual car wreck when someone hits a windshield, but not hard enough to break through and it turns white all around the point of impact, that is what the door looked like. Josh didn't have to tell me what to do this time. I ran to the register and I grabbed my phone, going to the corner farthest away from the front door, then huddled on the floor. I didn't even notice at the time, but Josh told me later that he turned to see the glass, and that was the first time that he had noticed that Nick had a hunting knife in his other hand. The fact that he had tried to punch Josh instead of stab him is a, a bit of a mystery, and maybe even a miracle. I was sobbing when the operator picked up the phone. I don't even know how she understood me. I was crying so hard, but between my distress and the sounds of Josh and Nick yelling at each other in the background with loud smashes of Nick hitting the door, she got the urgency of the situation pretty quickly. She asked me where I was, and luckily she knew the address because just as I got up to look at a receipt to see what the address was, the glass smashed. I dropped back on the floor and she told me that the officers were already on the way and to do whatever I could to get away or hide, even if I had to leave Josh. The hole wasn't big enough for him to get through and he had made it by grabbing the ashtray from outside and throwing it at the part of the window that he'd been repeatedly punching, causing it to break through. He didn't make it break through though. From that hole though, he could reach the lock on the door. 
According to Josh, he walked to the door and put his mouth against the hole that he had just formed and said in that horrible sing-song voice that he used the first time, they're never going to find you two. Needless to say, as tough as he was acting, Josh was panicking as much as I was. He was older than Nick, in his mid-30s, but he was a beanpole of a man and wasn't exactly known for his fighting skills. Even so, as soon as Nick unlocked and started to open the door, Josh slammed his body into it, knocking Nick backward from the impact. Josh yelled for me to run, and even though my legs felt like they would give out any moment, I ran right behind him to the receiving doors in the back of the store. Nick was cursing and yelling for us. The door jingle went off. Josh slammed into the back door, cursing in pain as he realized that it wouldn't open. We found out later that Nick had pushed the dumpster in front of the door, locking the wheels of it again before he came in. We seemed to both realize at once that he had actually planned this out, and it seemed like he had actually planned to kill us. Nick ran to the corner, still doing that awkward stumbling walk, though faster now. It at least gave me time to slam the back room door shut and lock it, though. I was sitting in front of it, Josh bringing over anything that he could find to barricade the door shut, when Nick reached it. He must have heard me crying because... He kept calling out my name, telling me that I wasn't who he wanted. He would make sure that I died before I ever felt the pain if I opened the door. He then started stabbing the door, screaming at me to open it. I screamed and moved when he stabbed it at first, but Josh and I both moved immediately to hold it shut again. I remember Josh and I making eye contact. We were both crying by now, and I wanted so badly to say something to comfort him, but I couldn't think of anything to say. I had actually dropped my phone when I ran to hold the door shut and neither of us could move to go and get it. So we had no idea how long until the police got there and the door was made of wood so it wouldn't last too long against his body slams and offered very little protection if his knife went into one of our hands. And all I could think about was this might be the moment that I die. That my dog would never know why I didn't come home that I would never get my degree and have enough money to actually start enjoying life, that all the other plans for the future, my girlfriend and I made, would never happen. And then, in the most anticlimactic and wonderful finish ever, it suddenly just went silent. There was no police car alarms, no yelling, nothing. It was as if Nick had just vanished. Josh and I looked at each other, not even daring to breathe, listening for any sign of life on the other side of the door. And we both slammed to the ground when a gunshot went off once, then twice, then a third time. There was more silence, then a voice rang out asking if anyone was there. We weren't sure if we should say anything. Then the voice continued with his name and that he was an off-duty EMT who had been listening to the scanner. Josh got up and pushed the things aside in front of the door, opening it just enough to put his head out of it, and then it just seemed like all the breath just left him. He opened the door and went out into the store, relief all over him. I ran and grabbed my phone, seeing that the call had disconnected or the dispatcher had hung up. But when I went out into the store where Josh and our rescuer were, he was in the middle of explaining that the police over the scanner were sending a bunch of cars, but they all were pretty far away and he had a horrible feeling that they wouldn't get there in time when the dispatcher was telling them what they'd find when they got there. Nick was actually found two weeks later in an old RV in the woods that he'd been using to do his drinking and do drugs in so that his wife wouldn't catch him. Apparently the reason that he'd come after us was because he thought that the reason that Josh wanted him to leave so quickly was so that he could call the owner again and this time the complaint would get him fired. Unknown to us, his wife had kicked him out four days before this happened and was in the process of getting a restraining order against him over threatening texts and phone calls that she'd been getting. He stated that his job was all that he had left and Josh needed to be punished for trying to take that away from him too. He said that I wasn't actually the target and he didn't want to have to kill me but he knew that he had a much better chance of killing Josh with me there than Dixie since Josh would be more likely to face him to protect me. And the reason that I'm sharing this story now is that, other than other stories here inspiring me, is that I got a call two weeks ago notifying me that 
As long as there's no setbacks to his health status, Nick is set to be released on June 8th of this year. When I called Josh, he actually said that he'd received the same news the day before. Neither Josh or I worked there anymore, obviously, and Josh has since moved away to another town on the other side of the city, and I've switched to going to college completely online, and I'm in a new place that I'm renting with a roommate. And I don't think that it'll come after either of us. I don't see how he could blame us for what had happened. And I've listened to so many of these stories, and after the fact, everyone seems to be so prepared for what to do if they ever see the person that they're writing about again. I don't think I'd be any more prepared to face him this time, though, than I was back then, if I'm being honest. I've also had pretty intense nightmares ever since that day, but ever since I got that call, every time I close my eyes, all I can hear is that one sentence louder and clearer than I've ever heard it since it was actually said. They're never going to find you two. My best friend in middle school was kind of messed up. Enough so that my parents would never let me stay the night at his house. He stayed at mine on several occasions, however. During our eighth grade year, he was actually expelled for selling weed at school. And after that, my Parents didn't really want me hanging around with him anymore. He came back to school a few months later after getting released from his alternative school for good behavior, and we became close again and started hanging out more in high school. But we didn't have the same friends, but always remained close and would always fall right back into being cool with one another. I remember at graduation that I was standing and talking to another friend of mine when he came running up and hugged me saying, we did it. Somebody made some sort of a homophobic joke or something, and he yelled back at them. He's my best friend since we were kids. A year or so later, he helped me pull my car out of a ditch when I skidded on some black ice. A year or so after that, though, I heard about a murder that happened at some student housing apartments. A few days later, I learned that it was my friend that had killed the other person in a drug deal gone wrong. A few months later... He messaged me on Facebook and recounted the whole story to me. His side of the story anyway. I haven't seen him since then, but I still have the Facebook messages. At the time of this story, my friend Ali, 20 and female, had just moved into a new place and I helped him move in. It was a basement suite. Not the nicest place, but we were going to make do. The basement had a cold room, and from what I understand, the people who owned the house butchered their livestock in there or something like that, because there was dried blood on the ground, and we were told it was from animals. That being said, though, we were in what I would describe as our party prime, so we wanted to go out as often as possible, which meant that we wouldn't be there often. While walking through the living room to exit, the cold room is visible. And every time that we would come home, the door would be slightly cracked open enough that you could notice quite visibly. Which was weird because we always closed it. Now, the door being open when we got home would happen quite often. And we grew accustomed to it, and it just sort of bothered us less and less in the end. But then she would have these violent sleep paralysis moments almost every night where she couldn't move and saw something holding her down and breathing in her face. And then one night, we had a movie night and fell asleep watching Netflix. I had woken up to get a drink of water and I noticed Allie sitting on her knees on the corner of the room, just sort of giggling to herself. Now, being slightly worried, I asked her what the heck she was doing. She sits up, looks at me, mouth wide open, head cocked to one side and in a super high pitched voice, asks if I see her and also asks if I can talk to her. I honestly thought that she was just being really weird and maybe playing a joke, so in the end, I just sort of went back to bed. The next morning, I wake up and I asked her to be honest and tell me what she was trying to achieve last night, and she promised me that she didn't do anything and that she had a really good night's sleep. In all honesty, I don't really know what happened, but I can't get the high-pitched voice that she made out of my head, even to this day.